closed captures are how we talk about estimating populations, the population estimation models. You've got a closed population, so there's some fixed number of animals out there, cap in, and that's what we're interested in. And this is this goes way, 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 way back. Um, the Lincoln Peterson Peterson estimator. Well, the Peterson estimator was published in 1891, but <clears throat> Laplace, the French mathematician, actually used something similar. We're back in the 1700s to estimate the number of people in France. The way he did it was to match up church records with cemetery records or something like that. I forget the exact details now, but he <clears throat> did this record matching thing and figured out that we ought to have this many people in France. So <clears throat> people have had this idea for a long, long time. And uh, so you'd think we'd sort of know how to do it, wouldn't you? <laughs> <clears throat> um, what gets us is this variation in detection probabilities. We assume that each animal has some specific probability of capture. If every individual is unique, it's almost impossible. You've got to somehow model that. So. The Otis et al. monograph, this is the Dave Otis that you guys all know, or not all of you, but some of you know, <clears throat> used to be here anyway. Um, he's now out in Colorado State enjoying himself <clears throat> uh, in retirement. Um, the Otis et al. monograph set up eight models. And the idea being that there's three different sources of variation in these detection probabilities. The first is that they vary by time or occasion. So uh, given that this stuff really got started with small mammal trapping, <clears throat> that's, that was sort of what drove the, the literature for a good many years. <clears throat> you can think of each night was different. You know, you had rainy nights and foggy nights and warm nights, and, and animals behaved differently, and you had different capture probabilities. So that's where this occasion or time t comes from. <clears throat> the second one is the behavior response to initial capture, and little b for behavior. Uh, back in the old days, why we clipped off toes, you know, that's how you marked it. Now, since you clipped toes, and, you know, when they showed up with nothing left, like you probably caught them too many times. Uh, <clears throat> uh, amphibians are, folks are still doing some of that, but the literature is pretty strong now that you should not be doing that. We got better ways of marking animals. Most animal care and use committees won't allow that. Um, these turtle guys, you mark them by drills. Yeah, yeah, drills and saws. And <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, but I mean, you can mark in their shell, and that isn't quite the same as cutting off toes. <clears throat> um, so anyway, the point being is that once they've been caught, Two things could happen. One is after they got their toes cut off, they didn't want to come back. Or alternatively, they like the bait so much that they're right back in. So as an example, snowshoe hares, they get so, they get to liking the alfalfa pellets so much that they keep coming back and eventually it kills them. They just eat too much of that stuff. It's just too rich for them. And literally, if you catch the same hare for three or four nights in a row and it's gorged itself on alfalfa pellets every night, probably not, <laughs> you're going to die right there in a the trap. <clears throat> so anyway, there's a behavioral response. You've got to think, watch out for that kind of stuff. The third thing, though, that kills us is the individual heterogeneity age. And that's where each animal has its own detection probability. You know, there's this innate, inherit or innate heterogeneity in, the, in this room. Uh, <clears throat> the other night when we went out to the brew pub, everybody drinks different kinds of beer, as an example. Some people didn't want beer. Some other people wanted wine. You know, you got this innate taste. Well, animals are the same way, obviously. They have a heterogeneity there that we can't even really explain. So anyway, that led to a series of eight models, with model zero being down in the bottom where you assume that every animal on every occasion, regardless of how many times they've been captured before, had exactly the same detection probability P. And then you go up to the next row here, and you've got MT, where you only allow for time variation, MA, MB for only behavioral responses, but otherwise everybody's constant, and MH, where you have individual heterogeneity. <clears throat> and then up the next row, where you have the mixtures of TB and TH and BH, and then at the top, TBH, where you allow for all three. And <clears throat> 
the original Otis et al. monograph did not have estimators for three of those. Didn't have estimators for this guy, this guy, or this guy. So basically these top three were not in program capture when it first came out. Eventually we did add estimators for a couple of these, but we didn't have anything for this. And the estimator for MH was a, <clears throat> was a non likelihood estimator. It was a non-parametric <laughs> estimator that Ken Bur Burnham developed during his PhD work, a jackknife estimator. So the whole thing was a good start, but it didn't last. We came up with some better methods now, much better methods. The parameters that we're going to start off with, and we're going to add, add to this set, but initial capture probability, initial probability capture P. So that's the probability an animal's caught on an occasion, given it's never been caught before. Um, so it, <clears throat> as you'll see, it can go along with a 1 minus P for quite a while before it finally gets caught. And if it's been caught, then the probability of being caught again is recapture probability C. And that's the idea that the difference between P and C is behavioral response, effectively. And that behavioral response can either be positive or negative. It doesn't, C is not limited to be less or greater than P. It, it can be either one. And then N is your population size. <clears throat> We've got two different versions of, of the likelihood. The full likelihood, we have N in the likelihood. And I'll show you some of that a little bit more later. And then we have these huggins alho Huggins Alho models where N is not in the likelihood, and those are useful for individual covariates that we'll see. Just to lay out this conditional binomial that we've used <coughs> to explain all the models so far, you start off your unmarked. And if you get caught with probability P, <coughs> then you've been seen now. And then from then on, you operate with probability C or 1 minus C, whether you're detected or not. And so if you're seen, and seen again, you get a 1, 1 PC. If you're seen and not seen, you get a 1, 1, 0 P, 1 minus C. And then 1 minus P, P, so you get a 0, 1, 1 minus P times P. Notice 1 minus P times P, no, no C now. You just, you haven't been caught yet until that occasion. From now on, you're going to get a C. And down below, 1 minus P, 1 minus P. So the zero zero encounter history, <clears throat> if we knew how many animals had the zero 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 encounter history, our answer is solved. We know the answer. But we don't, of course, that's what we're trying to estimate. And <clears throat> so that's the number of animals never caught, never seen, never observed. <clears throat> and you can see, kind of set the stage, there's no C's in there. It's all P. The probability of never being caught is just one minus P, one minus P, one minus P. So again, lay it out with four encounter histories, or four encounter occasions with P's and C's and so forth. How do we compute the probability of these different encounter histories? Same kind of a thing. So 1, 1, 0, 1, P1, C2, 1 minus C3, C4. OK. Uh, 0, 1, 0, 1. Now, see that preceding 0, because this is a closed population, and we don't catch them. We know they had to be there. That's under the assumptions of the model. So that zero in front means that, oh well, yeah, we missed it with one minus P1. Then we caught it with P2. And then one minus C3, because now that it's been caught, C4. And so forth and so on down the list here. And again, down here below, all zero, one minus P1, one minus P2, one minus P3, one minus P4. That's the probability that you're never caught. <clears throat> so the probability, you're caught, probability that you're caught one or more times is just one minus that product. <clears throat> so we're going to use maximum likelihood estimation, of course. And again, we're going to take that probability, that encounter history, to the power of the number of animals observed with that. That gives us our likelihood, or likewise, log likelihood is the number observed times the log of that probability of encounter history. N is estimated. Now, this is, this is approximately how the Huggins model works. <clears throat> I won't go into all the great details, but this is roughly what's going on. M of T plus 1 is the number of animals that we caught, the number of unique animals, the number of individuals that we put marks on. <clears throat> and the 
the notation seems sort of weird, m of t plus 1, what the hell's going on? Well, what it is, m is the number of marked animals. So m0, it's 0 because there's no marked animals when you start. m1 is the number of animals you mark on occasion 1. And m2 and so forth and so on. <clears throat> so m of t plus 1 is the number of animals that have been marked after occasion t, the last one that we did. So it's the number of marked animals in the population. It's the number of unique individuals. So that's where the notation m of t plus 1 comes from. It's the number of marked animals when we're all done. And <clears throat> so that's a count. Now, one, mi with a, one minus p1, one minus p2, or one minus pt, that's the probability you're never caught. So then again, one minus that's the probability you're caught one or more times. So you take that count and divide it by this probability of, of being caught one or more times, and that is your correction, that's your, corrects your count for detectability, so that gives you a population estimate. So roughly, that's how n is estimated. All population estimates depend on a count divided by a detection probability, whether you're talking about catch per unit effort or distance sampling or whatever you want to talk about. Even the Lincoln-Peterson, this is where I really do need a board, but. <clears throat> Um, um, <clears throat> in a Lincoln-Peterson, you think about you've got the number of animals you trapped on the first occasion, and then you've got the number of animals you caught on the second occasion, and then you know how many of those were caught before. So if you take your, what we call N1 and N2, and then M2 is the number of marks caught on the second occasion, you divide <clears throat> M2 by N2, or by N1, that's your probability of being detected. I, gotta, I have to write this out on the board, so I don't have a board, so I can't do it. But anyway, the point is you can twist this around, and it becomes very clear that you're dividing a count by a detection probability. And that's how all population estimators work, <clears throat> including change in ratio, another example of that. Uh, they all have to come down to that, a count divided by a detection probability. So, I won't talk about minimum number known alive. That's sort of the index that people use. When you have the full likelihood, <clears throat> and you put n in the likelihood, as opposed to what the Huggins model does, where it's confirmed <coughs> out, <clears throat> uh, you've got this number of animals never caught is n minus m of t plus 1, right? n's the population size. m of t plus 1 is the number you caught. So one minus n minus m of t plus 1 is... That's the probability of those, those animals is 1 minus p1, 1 minus pt, that product. And in addition, you saw the binomial distribution the other day where you had the little n over y, you know, the number of ways you could get y things out of n cases. Well, now all of a sudden, we got this population of animals, cap n. And when you put n in the likelihood, then that factorial term has an n in it, a cap n. So you end up with an n factorial, and you end up with an n minus m of t plus 1 factorial in these multinomial coefficients out in front, or binomial coefficients. <clears throat> and so it gets, uh, gets kind of weird when you do that. Now, the reason why I say no individual covariates is because think about animals that you never caught. You don't know their individual covariate value. You can't possibly know it because you never caught them. So that's why the Huggins model is so effective, because you condition that out. You say, OK, I'm going to assume that the animals I didn't catch are no different than the ones I did catch in the sense of their individual covariate values, which may or may not be a good assumption. <clears throat> and then from that, you're going to get your, your population estimate using individual covariates. So, but with the n and the likelihood, you can't use individual covariates. Because you've got this term in there for all the animals that you never caught, and you don't know what their individual covariates are. So basically, we tend to, we, even though the Otis et al. monograph was based strictly on these full in and the likelihood models, <clears throat> we pretty much steered away from those nowadays. There's a very small <coughs> loss of, of precision because you've done that, but it's really not important, and the gains from being able to use individual covariates more than offsets it. <clears throat> okay, so. How do we address heterogeneity and detection probabilities? Well, covariates, 
not that they work very well, but we always talk about them. We have these mixture models and we have this logit normal distribution that I'm going to talk about more later. Uh, <clears throat> so heterogeneity covariates, individual specific, habitat type, body size, gender, stuff like that. Body size in the case of closed captures work because you're usually talking about a very short period. In order to assume closure, you've got to assume that there are no animals uh, living or, or dying or leaving the area and vice versa, there are no animals coming in. So it's, it's got to be a fairly short interval <clears throat> in order to assume that survival rates are one. Uh, you get these survey specific covariates, local environmental conditions, water temperature. Uh, and again, we use these different models. For you fish guys, <clears throat> one of the major covariates we use is the length of the fish, an individual covariate, because you're electrofishing. And you all know that the bigger the fish is, the harder they shock, or the easier they shock, I guess to say. The harder the shock is on them. <clears throat> and so um, the length of fish is a one we always use for electrofishing studies. <clears throat> And so there's your set of covariates down below, the same trick we've already seen using log regression, logistic regression. <clears throat> Mixture models are something a little different. Um, one place you probably encountered mixture models in fisheries is commonly used to separate out links into age classes. You come up with these different normal distributions for each age class, uh, their lengths, and then you fit this mixture of normal distributions. Well, <clears throat> we're going to fit a mixture of distributions of, of detection probabilities, normally two, because that's about all we can ever handle. And <clears throat> so we have this mixture A, which occurs with probability pi. That's, that's given that you're in mixture A. And then mixture B is 1 minus pi. It's the probability you're in mixture B. Gives us a two-mixture model. Uh, the person that's done most of the, well, Ken Pollack up here on the right <clears throat> started it with a uh, student named, oh boy, it escapes me at the moment. Anyway, they tried to fit different mixture models, but they didn't specify mixtures quite the same way. And it didn't go very far. It didn't work very well. Um, but Shirley Pledger down in New Zealand, and this is Shirley sitting right there. <clears throat> she just retired here a few years ago. Um, she uh, really exploited this for her dissertation work and did a lot of simulations and has really promoted these mixture models. <clears throat> so the basic idea is you've got an encounter history that looks like this, probability detection 1001, say. So what's the probability of that history? Well, you got pi A times PA1, 1 minus CA2, 1 minus CA3, CA4. That's mixture A and its probability. Plus, down here's mixture B, which is just 1 minus pi A, and then PB1, 1 minus CB, and so forth and so on. And you wouldn't think these things would do much, but they, they provide a fair amount of flexibility. They do do some weird stuff every once in a while, too, that you're going to find out. I, I think we've done a lot better now. <clears throat> now, the key things about them, you can't tell what mixture each animal belongs to. You just have a probability that an animal and you know, you might be able to model pi as a function of individual covariates. I don't think I've ever seen that very well done or successfully done, but it seems like you should be able to. You just estimate this mixture probability, pi, and you're saying that probability of animals in mixture A is this, and probability of some B is that. <coughs> and that's about all you can say. Uh, <coughs> the catch is, <coughs> in order to detect individual heterogeneity and model it, you've got to have more than just a few occasions. The Lincoln-Peterson doesn't cut it. You've got to have at least four, really five. And even five isn't very good. You're probably talking more like seven or eight, which then starts to get you into trouble with closure assumptions. So, so this is why Richard Cormack told us years ago that we're all wasting our time, but we still do it. We've got surely a dissertation and many publications and <laughs> got me into a lot of programming and Mark and whatever. Um, now, the method that I'm a lot hotter about, <clears throat> a lot more excited about, and I think works a lot better and makes a lot more sense to me biologically is this logit normal trick. So if you take the, <clears throat> take a distribution on the logit scale 
and add on a random error. So the idea is here that we're going to take the load to the median p. Now, why do I say median p and not the mean p? Because these distributions are skewed again. In order, in order to get, um, well, you take a value of p and you take the load of it, which is just the log of p over 1 minus p, that value is going to be the median of the distribution that you're going to generate when you start adding on a random error. And the reason why is because the mean is always going to creep towards 0.5 towards the middle. So if you're down below 0.5, the mean will be above. If you're above 0.5, the mean will go towards 0.5. And that's because of that asymmetry that you created with that distribution. As it approaches zero, it can't go below zero. So the mean is going to go up because even though half your data are going to be below that median, their contribution to the mean is a lot smaller than the ones that went higher up. Vice versa, when you're above 0.5 and going towards 1, well, then you, you push back towards. So anyway, we talk about the median P as our median of the, of the P's that we're going to get out of this thing. And we add on this random error. And it, that's drawn from some normal distribution with mean 0 and, and standard deviation <coughs> sigma. And again, at least four, but more recently, five occasions are required to estimate sigma. How do we do it? This is just a more of a schematic of how we do, what's going on. But you got a you got a variance out there. This random normal is getting tacked on. <clears throat> each animal, each individual gets its own detection probability. Now, we don't know what those individual values are. All we know is that we're trying to estimate this sigma or sigma squared, depending on how you want to look at it. <clears throat> and then that median value in the middle. <clears throat> and how we do it is this is where I just wave my hands and go on. <laughs> uh, we've got this distribution. We've got a, we know what the load of P looks like. We've got the epsilons are distributed normally at zero sigma. We've got a likelihood that we have to integrate out that random effect. So we actually integrate where phi sub epsilon is the normal distribution for epsilon. We integrate out that effect. And we do that numerically using Gaussian Hermit quadrature. And so I, you don't want to go into that. Uh, again, this is something Mark does for you. And, and uh, you just understand the idea that we're integrating out that effect. Um, so we end up with a, we end up with a average P out of the distribution that we get done with. And we end up with an estimator that does a pretty good job of handling individual heterogeneity. The reason why I like this a lot more than, a, than the mixture model, the mixture model says there are just like two kinds of animals out there. This says that every animal has its own effect and we just integrate it out. The second reason I like it better is because there's only one additional parameter, sigma. Now, it takes a lot more computer time, <clears throat> but that additional parameter, sigma, uh, it's, it's, a, it's, again, it's that... <clears throat> It's that normal distribution where the errors are being drawn from, that bucket of errors that we go pull out of. And so as sigma gets big, why we got a lot more heterogeneity. And <clears throat> in contrast with the mixture model, sometimes it's sort of hard to get things to work. But this thing, it almost always seems to produce answers that are somewhat reasonable. So I like this normal, normally distributed random errors on a logit scale, a logit normal, really well. <clears throat> OK. This is just a repeat slide. You've seen this before. This is just saying that, OK, we got PIMs, we got design matrix, we got a length functions, and we got real parameters. We know all about that. We're going to walk through this example of taxicab data. <coughs> uh, individual heterogeneity has been the main topic of these models since clear back in the 60s. When people started to realize that individual heterogeneity almost always caused you to underestimate the population. <coughs> Why? Because which animals are you going to catch? You put out a set of traps, which ones do you catch? The ones with high Ps, right? I mean, they're the most likely ones to get caught. So you've got a P that's biased high, if, if you knew the truth. You know that your mean P that you're getting from your captured animals is going to be way too high. <clears throat> so you divide that P into a M of T plus 1 that's too low. No, it's too high relative to the value of the P that you're using. And the result is that you always underestimate. You, you way underestimate the number of animals that are actually out there. 
because you missed all the ones that had the low detection probabilities. So a number of attempts were trying to come up with data sets where we know the answer but yet seemed realistic. <clears throat> and the, one of the more creative of these was Andrew Carruthers in Edinburgh. He got a list of all the taxi cabs in the city. And there were 420 of them. And then he put observers out <clears throat> on street corners and when a taxi cab would go by, it would record the license number, the taxi cab number. And <clears throat> um, they'd do it for 10 occasions. Now, unfortunately, he, he had some screw-ups in the way, well, not screw-ups, just he wasn't thinking about it the same way I was. But, uh, <laughs> uh, he limited people when they got up to about 50 taxi cabs, they quit. In other words, an occasion consisted of you sampled taxi cabs until you recorded 50. They might be all the same, but they never were, of course. But uh, So your T effects, your time effects, are pretty minimal in these data sets. So, so the T models don't fit very well, which sort of ruins my example. But the heterogeneity part's great. You can visualize what the heterogeneity is in taxi cabs. You've got cabs that run from the hotel downtown to the airport back and forth all day. If you've got an observer standing on that street, they're going to record that cab lots of times, right? Back and forth, back and forth. You got other cabs that go out into the suburbs, in the hinterlands, picking up people to bring them into town. You hardly ever would pick those cabs up. They'd be much less likely to be sampled. So you got this vicious heterogeneity, which is exactly what we want to talk about. Behavior response, again, is a bit of an issue. I've only heard one good explanation for why you might have behavior response in taxi cabs. Anybody want to guess what it might be? <laughs> Depends on what your observer looks like. <laughs> how well she might be dressed <laughs> being sexist there but <laughs> yeah, I, don't know. I don't think that was the case I think the observers were quite unobtrusive so <laughs> so the point is we don't have any T and we don't have any B we really only have heterogeneity so from that perspective it's not a very good example but for other perspectives it's kind of nice because we do know the answer and we know exactly what the answer is Okay, so the Huggins Alho, Alho data type, uh, we can use individual covariates. N is a derived parameter. You saw derived parameters this morning when we talked about uh, product of survivals for known fate, as an example. We can still model average N because we can model average derived parameters. And so we don't have individual covariates for these taxi cabs, um, but certainly if we could record an individual covariate form like number of times they picked up people at the airport or something like that, I'll bet you could, you could do a lot better job of predicting. <clears throat> okay, you open up Mark, you click on closed captures over here, <clears throat> and you get this whole great big list. And <clears throat> six of those you can just pretty much ignore. Uh, the top one above the highlighted one is the full likelihood, P and C. That's where N is in the likelihood, and we just have P and C, no mixtures. Then we have the Huggins PNC, and that's, this is the order they went into Mark. That's why they're so kind of weird. And then we have the full heterogeneity, likelihood heterogeneity with pi and p. What that is is a, is a mixture model that doesn't have behavior response, doesn't have time effects. It's just a very simple MH model. And the reason why I left it in, put it into Mark is it, it makes it very quick to just run a heterogeneity model to see what's the evidence. Is there some evidence of heterogeneity? You don't have to do anything fancy to run that model. And then you have the full likelihood pi P and C, where now you've got all these P's and all these C's, and you've got the two mixtures and, or more, and it gets really nasty. And so that model takes a little more thought to make it work. And we'll show you what we do to it to do that. Then we have the same equivalence for Huggins. Huggins heterogeneity pi and P, the simple version, and then the more complex pi P and C. And then we have all these models that say misidentification on them. <clears throat> all right. The story there is that um, <clears throat> when people first started doing DNA sampling, and mostly they were doing this on bears with hair snares. They put out some bait and the barbed wire around it, and the bear goes through to get the bait and or you know go smell the scent or whatever, and they leave hair on the wire. You've all seen this kind of stuff. I got a good <coughs> video. I should have to find it and show you later. <clears throat> and uh, the then the DNA is collected from the hair and they run it through the genetics lab and they've identified that bear, right? 
Nice and simple. Each bear's got its own unique DNA. Well, when they first started doing this stuff, uh, they were all going to their local genetics lab. And those genetics labs didn't really know what they were doing. And they manufactured bears. What I mean by that? Well, when you're doing this kind of stuff, particularly when you've got somewhat degraded DNA that's been laying on a wire and been in the sun and the rain and night or two, you get what's called a lily dropout. So suppose that the allele, that the loci, the genetic loci consisted of a big A, little a. And suppose the little a dropped out. So when they did the electrophoresis on the, on the genetics data, only the big A actually magnified and showed up. And so they concluded the bear was cap A, cap A, big A, big A. Instead, it was really big A, little a. And there may, there, there's no other bear out there that would match that particular combination for all the loci they were sampling. And so they manufactured a new bear that doesn't exist, OK? Now, what's that do to the estimate? Well, first of all, MT plus 1 just got bigger by 1 because we manufactured a bear. Second of all, an encounter history that should have been, say, 1111 now consists of 1101 and 0010. We've, we've created another encounter history. So P goes down. So you think about what that formula does. When your P's go down and your M of T plus 1 goes up, all of a sudden your, your population estimate goes through the roof. So some of the first work that was done in Michigan, they came back and estimated about five times too many bears. And at least somebody said, whoa, this isn't right. We know this isn't right. There aren't not that many bears out there. And so eventually, uh, well, what happened then is the statisticians went to work and said, well, we're going to come up with models that try to correct for this misidentification, this misclassification stuff. And, and it's really a lost cause. And I'll tell you why. When you've got individual heterogeneity mixed in with this kind of stuff, you can't tell it apart. So Paul Lucas's dissertation at CSU was to do this. He tackled this problem. <clears throat> and he came up with these various models where you have a parameter alpha as a probability of correctly identifying the, the DNA. And if you have just a really small amount of that, you can sort of do it. Like a couple, three, four, <laughs> maybe at most 5%. After that, the models just totally break down. Well, we built, I put all these models in the mark with this misidentification, but I'm going to tell you don't use them. <clears throat> um, they don't work all that well, number one. Number two, if you think that you've got a misidentification problem, you've got to go back to square one and get your genetics done right. The bear people have figured it out. They have this guy in Canada, Dave uh, Pacow. I don't know anybody knows Dave Pacow. Anybody's done bear work would. Because everybody sends their, their bear DNA to him. I remember going to a, a bear conference down in, I don't know, I think it's North Carolina. <clears throat> and I met Dave, and, and uh, we were talking about this Miss ID thing. He said he doesn't make mistakes. You already know I'm way more of a curmudgeon and cynic, cynical person than that. It's like, give me a break, you know. You can't be that good. <clears throat> so then when Kate Kendall just started designing her Montana study, the, the uh, uh, Northwest Montana grizzly bear study, the one that John McCain jumped up and down about several elections ago about uh, how we're going to go out and study bear uh, Bear families, I forget how he said it, but you know, in a very nasty way. Anyhow, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> he wasn't happy about it. <laughs> and so I remember telling Kate, I said, you know, we've got a test pack out. I mean, you got to know that we can't, we can't depend on these mis mis ID models to fix this. We've got to have it right in the first place. And we got to know that he's doing it right. <clears throat> so we don't have to worry about this effect. So Kate set up 700 duplicate samples where you know it's the same bear, we know it's the same bear, and they're all blind, and sent them to Pacow, and he screwed up one, one of 700. So the next time I told him I had to apologize, or the next time I saw him I had to apologize. I said, yep, you don't screw up, you're right. <laughs> one out of 700, I'm perfectly happy. <laughs> I couldn't believe he could do that well. It, that's, I mean, that's just how good and thorough he is. And so people put a lot of money into him, but, but Vice versa, when you go out and do these kinds of studies, that's a small part of it. You've you got to get it done right. You can't, 
I call these models catalytic converter models. <coughs> That's because you're trying to put something on the back end of the automobile and make it better rather than make it more efficient up front in the first place. You want to make it efficient up front because you can't fix it on the back end. You just can't. We've got enough problems with individual heterogeneity. So anyway, Pacal, he, he's done it for bare people. And, and I think in general, the genetics people are just a lot smarter about it now. Um, they've, they've gotten a lot better too. But at first, they were terrible. <laughs> Jerry, the interesting thing is that McCain staff in Montana were all for that study. So there was a real disconnect between what he was saying and what his staff was saying within the state. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so that little story aside, those are what the 11, oh, the last one, last, my favorite, there it is, it's tacked on the end, it's the most recent one. That's the random, Huggins random effects. I never bothered to put in a full likelihood version of it because I don't think it's really necessary, but there w could be a full likelihood version of it, but it's really not important. Okay, so when you open up Mark with the P and C model in Huggins, does that say Huggins up there? No, but I know it is because there it is. There's capture detection probabilities 1 through 10 for P, and then there's 11 through 19 for C. Well, there's one less for C because you can't have a C1, right? Can't be recaptured on the first occasion. So there's one less, and that's what it looks like. And so you guys know about PIMS. You know all about how to manipulate PIMS. You know all about the PIM chart. There's a case where we got an N on the end of it, which would be a full likelihood model. You know all about the design matrix. Now, you, got, you can know how to do parallelism and models on the logit scale. You know about covariates, individuals, and others. And here's a Here's what a design matrix might look like if you had your P's in a time effect, with the last one being all zeros, and then here's your C's in a time effect. And <clears throat> this is for Huggins. We don't have an N in the likelihood in this case. And you know about some of the link functions, but in particular, we're going to probably be using a logit, although we don't always have to. We can use a sign in some of these models if you want to trick it. And you know how to manipulate the design matrix. All these things. So what happens when you run this global model right here? Looks like a perfectly legitimate model. Well, you're going to get back n equals m of t plus 1. How come? Well, <clears throat> the reason why is the last p is not estimable without a constraint. How come? For the same reason that the last P and P, P and P in the Cormac Jolly Sieber are confounded, for the same reason why the 1 minus S times R and the bend recoveries are not confo are confounded, because you don't have another occasion after that to catch animals that have never been caught before to say how many are still alive at this time, or still uncaptured rather in this case, are still uncaptured that we missed, but then we caught on the 11th occasion. And so that last P has to have a constraint somehow on it. Now, <clears throat> we do those constraints in a whole bunch of clever ways. First of all is model MT. If you want to run model MT in the PIMS, which yesterday you were very happy with, there's your P's and there's your C's. So what's, how's P10 getting estimated? From C10. You're saying that there's no behavior response and it's only time variation. And so you're saying all the P's and all the C's are equal. And that's a really nice model, as long as you don't have a lot of individual heterogeneity. <clears throat> in fact, it's probably the mainstay of the whole business uh, in general. So that's how you get that P10 estimated, because you make it equal to C10. Yeah? I just want to point out something that fisheries people might be interested in. Is, correct me if I'm wrong, but this is basically equivalent to the traditional Schnabel model. Similar. Sort of. Schnabel model does not incorporate all the, this is technically the Derrick model. Derrick, D-A-R-R-O-C-H. And Flo Schnabel's original model missed a certain part of the likelihood term that she didn't get into it. And so this would be equivalent, it is a model MT, and Schnabel model was an MT, but it's, uh, hers wasn't quite all there. 
And it doesn't include the recaptures quite the same way. That's where the catch comes. But yeah. I guess I meant the MT. It's MT, yeah. 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 You don't want to run Schnabel. You want to run Dart. You want to run this stuff in Mark. Because <laughs> that's a. Uh, uh, yeah. Now there's. Well, when I first went to Utah State on a postdoc in 76, the International Biological Program, most of you won't know what that is, but it was a big program to study the IBP, uh, study, and that's where we really got into computer modeling. They had a computer program there at the time that would generate 36 different estimates given capture recapture data. All, this, all the same data, I mean, just 36 different estimates. And you kind of sorted through and you found the one you like. Well, <laughs> you got to think that <laughs> the rigorous science doesn't work that way. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, so there's a whole history of these things out there. I mean, uh, statisticians have been doing this stuff. These are these ball and earn models that we always talk about. The statisticians have been doing this stuff for years and years and years. And They've got all kinds of them out there, most of which are not worth thinking about. But anyway, so yeah, Schnabel's model led to Derek, actually. She published her work in 30-something. She was at the University of Tennessee, and maybe a little later than that, maybe the early, late 40s. I don't know. I can't remember exactly. But Derek came along like in the 50s and published his extension to it. <clears throat> OK, so that's how you, well, let me go back up. That's how you run model MT with just the PIMs. But of course, I'm telling you, you don't, the PIMs, you sort of set them up once and you forget about them. So you should set them up like this, more general, like the way they came to you. And then what you do is you set up the design matrix like this. So now you got your, your intercept, you got your P's all the way down to P10, which is your zero row across, and then you've got the C's, and of course you've got to be sure to leave off that first one because it doesn't exist. So C2 corresponds to P2, and down it goes. So there's your model MT in the design matrix. Okay? Questions on that? That all makes sense? Again, you can always check yourself by running it in the PIMS, but then you can turn around and run this and make sure you get the same model MT. So this is assuming that the, capture, the initial capture probability is the same as the recap. Yep. Well, just time. Just time. They're all time varying. I mean, but they vary exactly the same. I mean, C2 and P2 are identical. And how do I know that? Because you run across, you got an intercept plus C2, intercept plus, well, B3, I should say B3. All right, how about model MB? Again, we're keeping that same set of PIMs. You're going to get the picture here. We're building up. We keep, we're using the design matrix to build up. Here's our intercept, same intercept as before. But now all the C's are different by this offset. Now, you could put it offset up there and have these zeros, which would be consistent with what we were doing yesterday. But I always think of it that the P's are what we're really after, because that's what the population <coughs> estimate depends on. And so I like to think about, OK, I want to have the P's kind of native. And then I'll put the offset on the C's. Uh, that's just the way I think about it. But it doesn't matter which way you do it. You're going to get exactly the same answer. What you're saying is that P's and C's are different, but they're all constant otherwise. So you got one P and one C, right? Two parentheses. Model M0, that's not hard to think out. <laughs> OK. How about model MT? or TB. All we got to do is merge the two. So we've got our intercept. We've got all of our time effects, just like we had before. But now we put on this C effect. <clears throat> and it's still, the fact is that, that P10 is getting estimated by C10. So we're still fine. OK? Kind of hard right after lunch, I know. <laughs> Getting indigestion already. 
It's going to get better. <laughs> uh, all right. Questions on this? I want to let you think out about it for a second. Yeah. So why, I mean, I guess, I'm trying to think biologically, why we get nervous. Why would you do this? Instead of initial and Sorry, I'm not following the question. So the, you add this, this behavior problem, uh -huh. but it only applies to the recap problem. Right. So why, I, I'm just thinking, because it's that behavior response. Yeah, they became trap hacker. They became trap shy. Uh, the initial capture has to happen first, and then they. Yeah, and then yeah. So see, yeah, the animal only drops down into where they're using C's after they've been caught once. So now they're still using the same time duration, but they get this add-on. So we've just added one parameter to the little T model. MT, MTB gets one additional parameter. And again, there's other ways you could try to do this stuff, but we've principal parsimony. We're trying to keep the number of parameters down and still get to capture the effect that we're after. So we're just saying, if I were to draw it on the board, we're saying that P and C go along through time in parallel, depending on whether that thing is positive or negative. C might be up here or it might be down there. That last term. Yeah. And in some cases, C could even be zero. Yeah. Well, C can't. Oh, yeah. Removal studies, C is zero. And so uh, when you do that, what you literally do, if you're doing a removal study, you, you've got your P's. You, they have to be pretty much constant. You can't have time variation if you're going to do a removal study. This is the <coughs> zip and removal estimator. But what you do is you just fix your C's to zero. And I haven't shown you how to fix stuff. I should do that. that I'll make a note here. And we'll, we will, you can fix real parameters to values. I call them fixing the parameter. So what you would do is you'd make all your C's, you take the C PIM and you'd make them constant and you'd make that parameter equal to zero. I that's not quite a research was an un unintentional removal study. I wasn't actually removing them, uh -huh. but they were so trap shy that our, 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 we never caught, we never got any recaptures, but our catches as we continue with the sampling, our catches, oh. catches declined, just like a, just like a removal. Like study. a removal, we yeah. Basically remove, we were removing them from the catchable population. Yeah, yeah. So, so you got a population estimate. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, uh, a lot of electrofishing studies, particularly the small stream studies that like I'm familiar with it in Colorado all the time, they, you know, they haul them out on the bank. They don't put them on the bank. They put them on a bucket, <coughs> put them in a bucket on the shore. And then you know, they make three or four passes down through the stream. And so it is a removal state. And C is equal to zero. Yeah. Yep. <coughs> OK. Now we're going to get into the fun part, the heterogeneity. Those models so far have been cute. Now we're going to get into stuff. <laughs> Capture probability PA with pi and PB with 1 minus pi. This is just the simplest pleasure mixture model. And so we've only got three parameters. And what you do is you go back in, and you haven't seen this trick yet, but in Mark, these models are all, all the same likelihood. Well, the Huggins models are one likelihood. The full likelihood models are a different likelihood. But all the Huggins models, here, here, and even these misIDs and all that stuff, they're all compatible. They're the same likelihood. You can get from one to another. And so you can have an AIC table where you have different data types, which you haven't seen before, but they're all consistent. And in fact, well, no, I shouldn't say what I was just going to say. I won't say it. <laughs> so here's what the, the uh, PIMs look like for that simple Huggins heterogeneity pi and p model. There's your pi up here. And down here are your PA and your PB. They're stacked vertically because in Mark, the PIMs always go across with time. And vertical was cohort. And it seemed like a lot more sense to think of these things as cohorts rather than time. But plus, I think it really. Well, you're going to see why. Another reason here in a minute when we get to P and C's, because we're going to have P through time. 
But so anyway, they're stacked vertically. So that vertical structure is a mixture. Okay? PA and PB. So every animal out there either is A mixture or a B mixture. And so they either have PA or PB. <clears throat> and so you can run that model, and that's all there is to it. I mean, it just there's no design matrix required. You just run it. The reason for doing that is just to have a very quick and dirty model, no, quick and simple model, not dirty, quick and simple model that will generate model MH with no fuss, no bust, just away you go. Okay, now let's come back and pick the Huggins pi P and C. And now this is where the fun starts. <clears throat> okay, here's our pi. Here's our P's for mixture A and mixture B. And here's our C's, mixture A and mixture B. So you can see we got an issue here. We got 39 parameters. <laughs> We're not going to estimate 39 parameters. I mean, we'd never be able to estimate 39 parameters. So how do we get around it? We put on constraints. And what we do is we put on constraints in the way of parallelism additive models. So here's model TH2, the two meaning that there's two mixtures. <clears throat> so. Here's our pi up here in the corner. Here's our intercept across all the P's and C's. There's a time effect on PA. There's a time effect on PB. Here's an offset that says that mixture A is different than mixture B. So we're saying that all the P's are going along in parallel, but there's a constant on the logic scale difference that is parameter B12. Like a vitamin. And down here we have occasion C2 through C10. And C for, for the B mixture. And then there's that same B12. So the C's are going through time exactly the same. It's a model T, so the C's and B's are identical. But the mixtures, we've added one parameter to get a difference between the A and the B mixtures. So all those 39 parameters boil down to a model MT plus two more parameters. We had to have 10 before, now we've got 12. We've got a pi and we've got a, a, a mixture effect. So the P's and C's again are going through time in parallel. But they got a PA and a PB. The PA and the PB are going through time in parallel and are identical to the CA and CB. Yeah? Can you think of a mixture as sort of, sort of as two groups, but you don't know exactly what the groups are? One way to think about it, I, I, always, I don't use the term group because we kind of reserve group for attribute groups and mark, but right. yeah, but mixture, that's what they are. They're, you got two kind, kinds of animals out there, some that are easy to catch and some that are hard to catch, and you can't tell them apart. And so here's another way to think about it. <clears throat> Let's just back up for a second and say that we've got a, a simple binomial, but we've got two kinds of animals. And so half of our animals have a, a 0.3 probability, and the other half have a 0.7 probability. Well, on average, they've all got 0.5. If you were to, if you were to run the 0.5 value and generate the binomial variance, you'd see you had a, you'd have a nice curve. When you run the 0.3 and the 0.7 separately and put them together, you get the same kind of function, but it's just broader. It's lower at the top and it's broader. It's a broader, you've got more variance. What these, this is where I need a board. Uh, so what's going on here is that these, these estimators work based on that variance. There's, there's additional extra binomial variation operating in these models with this mixture effect. And they can handle it. Whereas if I run a straight model MT on this, the difference would be because of that extra variance. And so, <clears throat> yeah, it's... The reason why it takes at least five and if not more occasions to detect this heterogeneity is you, you've got to have 
enough observation that you can detect this extra binomial variance with this mixture distribution. That's what it, that's sort of what it summarizes it down to. Okay, <clears throat> anybody want to guess what TBH looks like? You already know because it's the next slide. But there's old same model we just had, and we added on a behavior effect. We put in the B effect. So now we've got a 13 parameter model, TBH, which is only three more than TV, or model MT, which is now. You can have lots of other options, but this is what I would consider the most parsimonious uh, TBH that we can get. And there's other options, but this is what I would tell you. And well, the reality of it is these data are never good enough to do much more than something like that. The difference between the regular TBH model and the like TBH2 we have up there, what is the two standard? Two stand for two mixtures. Yeah, two mixtures. So in both cases, now Mark Mark will ask you how many mixtures you want, and you can specify ten if you want, but you won't get very far. <laughs> Start with two, and then if you really, if it's really a good model and doing well, you might even try three. Uh, but I know that function works because. Uh, Oh, somebody sent me some genetics data. It was some kind of a weird. I didn't understand what the analysis was all about, but they. Uh, it wasn't genetics data on animals. It was some kind of like estimating the number of something that I never. I don't remember what it's all about. But anyway, I was able to start playing with that, and I was able to get up to like six or seven mixtures, and it was fitting them fine. It was. It was. I don't think it's simulated data, but it was something pretty weird. But so I know that Mark will actually do it. I, I, I've simulated data with three and four mixtures, and I know I can get it back if I get a good enough data set, way bigger than what you're ever going to get out in the real world. But, but for real data, two, you're lucky if you can get two to fit. And that's with the pi. Yep. That's when you have a mixture model, you're using the pi. Piece. Yep. Yep. And if I have like three mixtures, I'd have a pi one and a pi two, and then I'd have well pi a, pi b, and then pi c would be gotten by subtraction. Yep. But yeah. But because I've only got two mixtures, I only need one pi. And like ecologically, those mixtures are basically just expressing differences in catchability. Yeah. Catchability. Yeah. You're trying to yeah you're trying to pick this extra binomial variance up. The fact that that just a simple binomial isn't cutting it, and we've got to have extra extra variance in there. Uh, so yeah, I just showed you that. Okay, here's BH2. BH2, I just stripped out the T's. Okay, and then the logit model, the logit normal, go back and select the last one off that list. <clears throat> and so it comes back, there's your sigma, called sigma P. There's your P's and there's your C's. And so then you can run your model uh, M0, random effects. I, I label them RE for random effects. So you've got a sigma and you've got an intercept. Okay. And then, of course, you've got a model B random effects. All this is is just the same model you had before, but now you got a sigma out there in front of it. And you've got a model T random effects. And a model TB random effects. <laughs> so, as an example, I could take any of those and just pick sigma to zero. What have I got? Right back to the PC formulation. So I really don't need a whole bunch of these different data types in Mark since I have this. All you got to do is fix sigma to zero. And then that forces like that would just become model M0 right there. You'd have, you'd have no choice because sigma is zero. So all the random errors are zero. So you just have model M0. OK? So forth and so on. 
Results browser, you've been playing with that lots. Here are some of the results for the for the uh, 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 taxi cab data. And unfortunately, Model M0 wins, but uh, you can bet that that's an underestimate because we know there's a lot of heterogeneity. You see that the Model 0 random effects ranks pretty high. MB pops in there, which doesn't make a lot of sense to me because I don't know where the behavior response is coming to. Other, well, I should I should back up. The reason why that happens is because MB kind of looks like individual heterogeneity if you think about it. Suppose you get trap happy animals, then it looks like some of these animals are more captable than others, and so all of a sudden, uh, the fact that you got a lot of encounter histories with animals that have been captured multiple times, it looks like it could be MB. I mean, they sort of look similar. If I give you two sets of data, one that's MB and one that's MH, you can't tell them apart. Just looking at the encounter histories, it, it's MB would have animals that, have, if they had a lot of trap happiness going on, there'd be lots of animals caught multiple times. It looks like they've got really high detection probabilities. And you've got other animals that only got caught a time or two, and they look like they've got low detection probabilities. And so it's, it all kind of blurs together. That's why the model selection job is pretty difficult. So anyway, B shows up, MH2, there's your pleasure mixture, that's just that simple one. And then we got a B random effects, which again, why B should show up in there, I don't know. And then all your T models fall down out at the bottom because like I said, uh, when Carruthers designed this thing, he, he had all the T's. He stopped sampling at somewhere around 50 taxis each day. so. You never see more than about 50 or so. Yeah. Well, I've run the closed capture models. It seems like I have a lot of problems with the parameter counts not being right, or at least I wonder if they're right. Do you have to go in and adjust some of these parameters? Not, not with the Huggins. Where you have to adjust them is when you have a full likelihood. See, that's what I've always used. Yeah. Now, you, you ought to jump over to the Huggins. It's a, it's a lot more numerically stable. And, and the loss in precision is negligible. And now, I only put the random effects model into the Huggins. So, you get everything out of the Huggins that you get out of here, out of the full likelihood. But you don't have this, this parameter. What happens is uh, the end parameter, because it's got a log link on it, it's actually estimating F0. And you got a log link on that, and that'll often not get counted. Particularly when you got estimates that are close when F0, the number of animals you didn't catch, is close to zero. Well, then it always. Yeah, anyway. Yeah. Okay, no, here's your parameter counts. This, is, this tells you what each model should be for the Huggins mixtures. So these are mixture models, but. Uh, you can compute how many parameters you should, should get just based on those formulae. And here's the same thing for the Huggins random effects. And all they are is just the regular Huggins plus one. <laughs> and then there's the full likelihood if you, you want to play with it, with the random effects, or with the uh, mixture models. So those, are, those three slides are just in your book for your reference. <clears throat> okay, model selection. We know all about model selection now. Uh, Akaiki's information criterion. Mark ranks models based on their AIC C values. I should have a C on there. Uh, we know about delta AICs. We know about Akaiki weights. going to use those in just a minute. All right. Uh, I've dodged this question just because of, nobody's asked it and because, but how do we put these logic confidence intervals on? Well, uh, you compute your, your parameter and then you back calculate out what the standard, well, the variance or standard error of that logit value is. <clears throat> and call that beta for this case. Or you can think of it if we didn't have it in a design matrix, if it's just like a simple PIM, 
that beta would be exactly what we estimated. And so then what we do is we put a confidence interval on the beta based on that standard error that we computed on the logit scale of plus or minus 1.96 times the standard error beta. And then we expit it back to get the confidence interval. And so what it does then is it forces that confidence interval to be between 0 and 1. And there's just another, another point about this expit function is just either that or with a negative. Now, when you get parameters close to the boundary, the thing will kind of tend to blow up. In other words, like suppose I get an estimate that's pretty close to 1. Well, it'll tend, because there's very little probability that it's in that range between the parameter that's estimate and 1, there's just very little room left there, it'll tend to extend that boundary way down low. And vice versa, if it's very close to 0, or pretty close to 0, and it's got a big standard error, it'll put a big confidence interval that runs way up high. So sometimes the fact that we force these things to be between 0 and 1 doesn't always lead to what we want. And we have another trick called profile likelihood confidence interval that we'll, we'll talk about here at some point. <clears throat> but, uh, and that, by the way, is one reason to run the full likelihood, because you can get a profile likelihood confidence interval on end. But anyway. All right. Normally, in I put on confidence intervals that are based on a log normal distribution. And they use this big hairy formula. <laughs> so the number of animals, estimated number of animals never seen is F0. We, we call it F0. So the frequency of animals that are seen zero times. And that's just equal to n hat minus m of t plus 1, m of t plus 1 being the number we saw. So then the number of animals seen m of t plus 1 times, we take F0 divided by C, C comes from this, plus M of T plus 1, and then we have UCI, the upper confidence interval, F, F0 times C plus M of T plus 1. And that'll give us a confidence interval that never goes below M of T plus 1. Wouldn't make sense to have a, a bound lower than M of T plus 1 because you had those in your hot little hands. You caught them. Or I guess if they're bears on hair snares, you had your hair snared. <laughs> You know they're out there. And this C function, C thing, is that big long formula, but it, it comes out of the log normal distribution. The standard error of N is exactly the same as the standard error of F0 because the difference between those two is just M of T plus 1, and that's a fixed constant in the analysis. It's a known quantity. There's no variance on it. So that's how we compute confidence intervals for N. Model averaging is a big deal with popu closed population estimation. And the reason why being that, that um, we get all these different models. And you saw that just a minute ago. That list, I mean, we got all these different weights. And you know, none of them are clear cut head and shoulders above the rest. So model averaging is something we do a lot of. Uh, Simulation, I won't probably talk about simulation right now. We'll give you a chance to get into these things first. But uh, simulations are a big deal because when we design these studies, we want to be able to simulate data and find out just how well we're going to do. And so uh, we'll get into that a little bit later. <clears throat> variance components, we haven't talked at all about variance components estimation, but uh, nah, I won't go into it right now. That's one of the more advanced stuff. Model averaging, I've already talked a little bit about it when I did some survival the other day. But the best, the selecting the best model means that we estimated precision is too well, too good. 95% confidence on coverage is going to be less than 95%, which is not what we want. So we want to be able to incorporate this model selection and certainty into our estimate and obtain proper confidence on coverage. And the way we do that is these are the formula. You actually haven't seen those until now. Well, uh, you saw this one yesterday, but it wasn't written out quite like that. But exponential negative beta or delta i, that's a model of interest, divided by the sum of that same quantity for all the models, all R models. We got our, our weighted average, the weights coming from that formula there. These are the estimates from each of the models. And then this is how the variance is computed. <clears throat> and the variance is actually kind of simple when you look at it. This is the variance of of that parameter given the model. So it's, it's 
think of it as a standard error squared for that particular parameter out of the model. That's what this term would be, the standard error squared. Over here is just the variance computed across the mean value and that parameter estimate in that model, the estimate out of model MJ. And so that quantity squared. So you sum all that up and that's your variance. It's basically a weighted variance. So it's intuitively it makes sense, right? <laughs> uh, it does make sense. <laughs> I don't care what you think, it makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> so that's model averaging. We do model averaging on N all the time. So again, let's see, there, that is the same slide. There it shows you've got all, this, all those models and not much weight on any one of them. When I model average, okay, now this is cool. I like this. Here's my model M0. It's got a weight at 0.31. And we've got an estimate of 369. And it's got a standard error of 14 is 0.6. I mean, way too small. That's a precise wrong answer, I guarantee you, because we know this heterogeneity, we know model zero always underestimates when there's heterogeneity, and we know that its standard error is always too small because it, it doesn't account for that heterogeneity. Here's my model M0 random effects. It only got 20% of the weight, poor thing. <laughs> but look at that estimate, 391. That's a hell of a lot closer to 420 than what 370 is. <laughs> Not a lot closer. At least it got a little more reasonable standard error on it. That makes sense. As soon as you start having individual heterogeneity, you're going to have bigger variances. You just have to. Because, I mean, you're now trying to estimate this distribution of capture frequencies. And there's model MB, and it's too tight. But it, it's funny how it, it, it's a lot closer to the answer, which is sort of weird. And then we get this guy, MH2. What happened to it? Well, I'll tell you what happens. MH2. Uh, it's a nasty little beast. <laughs> what happens is one of those pi, the p's, even though it may have a very small portion, the pi may be very, the contribution of that may be very, very small, that p gets really, really small, and then when you blow that into mt plus 1, it just goes to the root. So that's what's happened here. That effectively is infinity. <laughs> so MH2, it's not uncommon for these mixture models to blow up. And they give you garbage. And so obviously, you just have to toss them out. I mean, you don't have any choice. They're, they're obviously, that's not the answer. <laughs> not even close. <laughs> Here's MB random effects. And you can see it's 415. And so anyway, the whole thing is because of those H2 models that are blown up, the whole thing. But Forrest Gump says, <laughs> OK. So we get. Get those out of there and go back and model average. And so here's what you get. <clears throat> and so when we get all done, our weighted average is 387 with now a new standard error of 34. This 95% confidence interval is computed as just plus or minus two standard errors. The model averaging doesn't understand about that log normal M a T plus one confidence interval. So you have to compute it by hand. And so here it is, MIT plus 1 is 283. The log normal confidence interval is 338 to 479. Not too bad, given that there were 420. A lot closer than what we've been able to do for a long time with these estimators, I'll tell you that. <laughs> OK, there's a, that's just how you can compute that thing in a spreadsheet. Uh, I think that spreadsheet may even be on your zip drive. But there's your M and T plus 1. There's the estimate. There's a the standard error. There's where I computed C. There's a formula for it up above. And then multiply or divide by it. Add on M and T plus 1. So that's how you get that formula out. And getting close here. Uh, this is just to point out this how M0 gives you a precise wrong answer. Um, why did it do what it did? Well, we got a mean <laughs> estimate of 0.13, which is too high. I mean, the, the true capture probability out there had to be a lot lower than that. 
it ends up at that estimate of 370. And these confidence intervals, by the way, are computed with the uh, correct C formula, the log normal formula. Down here is my sigma p. You can see it got a lower p because of that variance. That the sigma value is 0 0.35736. And so it got a little lower P, and that's what raised it up. But it also cranked up the standard error, which actually makes a lot of sense. It should. But it's a lot better behaved than model MH2, the, the mixture models. Um, here's the same thing from the full likelihood versions, where in this case, the P's for the full likelihood actually work. That's back to what you've been doing. You run the full likelihood of the mixtures. And so uh, there's the same MH2, and you can see it's almost identical, I mean, which it should be. <coughs> Not exactly identical, but close. But here's our pi. So 62% of the weight from went into this 0.15, and therefore 38% of the weight went into 0.03. That's your PA and your PP. So that generated an estimate of 463 with a standard error that's huge. Again, that's another characteristic of these mixture models. They tend to be too big a stand I, I won't say too big, but they're huge. <laughs> and so now you get an estimate that's, you know, sort of worthless compared to my, compared to my baby <sighs> right in there. <laughs> OK, simulation. We'll do some simulations before we get out of here this week. You guys are, we're, we're ahead of schedule by at least a half a day at this point. Yeah, question. Uh, since we're ahead of schedule, I <laughs> will ask you about um, bottle evergreen. Okay. So, you want to go to the slide? Like, should you really be doing that under all circumstances? Like, what, what circumstances would you use model Would I not model average? Or would it? Well, when you're talking about population estimates, model averaging is just made to order. Because you, so often you end up with this whole list of models and, and uh, you know, you just don't have a good reason why one of them ought to be totally correct and all the rest of them wrong. And, and so, uh, I mean, in the Carruthers taxi cab data, if, if I, oops, if I, uh, we're told I could only run, run one model. It'd obviously been this one because I, I mean the whole thing was designed to look at heterogeneity and time and behavior just shouldn't have been there. And so I would have just run this one and I would have, I would have stopped right there and I'd have got my estimate that whatever we got a minute ago and that'd been it. But in the real world, it's usually time and behavior and everything's important. I mean it may not be really important, but it's probably out there. And so then you end up with this whole list of models like that, lots of model weights that are all, you know, no clear winner. I mean, 0.3 versus 0.2, that's not exactly a clear winner. And so then you end up running model averaging. And so for population estimation, it's a big deal. Now, for things like survival, uh, again, it depends a lot on what you're trying to find out. But if you want your best estimates of survival for I don't know, whatever you want them for, and you want a series of estimates, that's probably what you want to do. Because you, again, you've sorted through the data with different models. I mean, you had alternative explanations for what was going on out there. And so therefore, it makes sense that you should incorporate that model selection stochasticity, that randomness that you introduced yourself into your estimate. And OK, so those are all kind of theoretical reasons practical, pragmatic reason. I can show you a paper. Uh, I don't know whether we're going to do the hen clam data or not here, but we may get to it. Uh, we had an exercise for years that we used to put students through at the workshops uh, where they ran this hen clam data. It was a, basically it was a test. We'd give you the data. We'd, it was it had a, a write-up that told you all these little details and these little hints about how you ought to be trying to analyze it and all these different effects, and you had to build the models and run it. And, um, the students would work in teams, and we recorded this for several years, what the results were. And interestingly enough, that when, even though a lot of times, you know, they're like you guys, you're, you're, they're sort of floundering around, they're not quite sure, and they're doing this and they're doing that, but when, when the dust settled and they'd done model averaging, a lot of times they were right on. 
Now, it was a particularly nice data set, so maybe a little, little bit of a bias, but, but the point was that model averaging saved most of them. They might have some really hokey model in there that they shouldn't have had, but yet with model averaging, it sort of all worked out. So uh, from a practical standpoint, model averaging cures a lot of ills. I mean, I, I've seen it happen too often. Same thing here. I mean, if we don't model average, well, I got to take that. I took those guys out, but uh, you know, if I model average, we got pretty close. A lot closer than we would have gotten if we had just taken our top model. That's for sure. You know, this one blew up, but let's go to the next one. You know, I mean, the 391 and the 396 and the 40, all these others pulled this thing up enough that. It, got pretty close. If we could really estimate populations of taxi cabs within, what is that, uh, 33, if we could get within 33 all the time, less, less than a 10% error, I'd feel pretty good. Richard Cormack might like it. <laughs> uh, nah, it's, the problem with, this is a more theoretical, Point about this kind of work. In these closed capture models, you're basically trying to model this distribution of this heterogeneity. <coughs> and you can have lots of different models that all look identical. So a beta binomial, this logit normal, uh, some gamma models that have come out, they all look the same in terms of the way they model, but they give quite different answers. And Bill Link has published a paper, Bill Link being always the, he's the guy that keeps this whole profession honest. Uh, one of them anyway. And he's published a paper about how we can't identify the true underlying distribution. We just can't. I mean, he sided with Richard Cormack. And uh, that's true. We can't. But my comeback to Bill is that, look, we're not going to sit still and just say, no, we can't do it. And let's just try to be realistic about models that make some biological sense. And to me, the logic normal. First of all, the logit the logit transformation, that whole idea of how we model P just makes so much sense. We got this nice symmetrical distribution around 0.5. It's been used forever. And the second part of it is adding on that random error where every individual has its own random error just makes total sense to me. That handles that individual heterogeneity. And the fact that it works so well in the sense that it, uh, if you give it adequate data, you will nail the answer. So, so anyway, when do you not model average? Not very many times. I mean, most of the time you, you want to be thinking about model averaging is how to analyze it. Let's see. Simulation. All right. You do this to design studies. Way too often we go charging off in the field thinking we're going to learn something. We don't have a prayer because we don't have enough adequate, we don't have adequate sample size. We don't, everything about it was done wrong. And we waste a lot of time and come back and then a couple of years we conclude we just wasted a couple of years of effort on it and forget it. So that's what simulation is trying to avoid. I want to just show you some examples here. Um, a sigma of one is a big deal. That's a, that's a lot of variation. And so the median P of 0.3, that means that we got a, that half animals have a P of 0.3, a little more than 0.3, and half are less than 0.3. But again, they can't, they can only go down to zero, where 0.3 above, they can go all the way to one. So the mean is probably more like 0.4. N equals 100. If I run four, which is an absolute minimum, I'm going to get an average N hat of 113. This is based on my simulations with an average standard error of 44. I bump it up to six just a little bit, I get a big improvement. And you can see as I keep going, we're zeroing in on 100, just where we're supposed to be. And so, you know, if you came in and told me you're only going to go out and trap four nights and you think you got that kind of level of heterogeneity in the population, I'm telling you, yeah, you probably want to stay home. Because, yeah, sure, I got an average of 113, and I'll bet there's some estimates that are way lower than that and way higher than that, especially given I've got a standard error that's, that's nearly 40% of my estimate, a CV of 0.4. And that's not very much, not very good. So, you know, you can, from simulations, you can really learn a lot. Uh, 
Here's the same thing for the mixtures. Again, you see I like the other one a lot better. I said pi of 0.5, and I got PA 0.5, PB of 0.1, so that gives me that 0.3 kind of median in the middle again. And I don't do nearly as well. The four did better, I guess. Well, I don't know whether I'd say that's better. It's actually, yeah, it's off by the same amount, but just by a slow. Much better standard error, though. But six, eight, ten, it takes, it takes a lot more data to get this thing to converge on the true answer. So anyhow. So if you want to learn more about the Huggins random effects models, we just had a paper come out in JWM on it. Evan and I worked on that, I don't know, a couple different years and finally got it published. Well, finally got it to a publisher is really what it amounts to. <laughs> the incentive to publish isn't nearly as strong now as it used to be. <laughs> I don't get an increase in salary. Or <laughs> All I have is a personal satisfaction knowing I finally got a project done that I've been working on for a long time. <laughs> Okay, so questions on the closed captures. Yeah. It's more of a comment. Um, one thing I've learned from doing the closed capture stuff is you gotta be really careful interpreting what N really means. Yeah. Because it's confusing people will say population estimate without defining what population they're talking about. Yep. It's actually my understanding is it's the, the population of animals that are vulnerable to your sampling. Yeah. Which is not necessarily, well, working with fish, people will often assume that it's all the fish in the lake, which is often far from the case, depending, yeah. on, depending on how they did the sampling. And your gear, the selectiveness of the gear, and all this kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. and it may be, you know, only the ones that happen to be near shore at the time that you were sampling, stuff like that, that people often don't yeah. traditionally have thought about. Yeah. So. Well, this is way personal opinion on the soapbox, but um, the first thing the reporters always ask is how many are there? And that's totally the wrong question. They ought to be asking is the population going up or is it going down? Yeah. But but the question we get asked is immediately is how many are there? And and you tell them there's 336.4 and that's what's in the paper the next day. <laughs> it's stupid. Uh, <laughs> They ought to be at, they don't ask the right questions. Of course, they don't know they don't ask the right questions. Though. Anyway, uh, we need to get away from this population estimation thing because we're never going to do a great job of it, I guarantee you. I mean, it just, and, and this paper that I've got on the screen right now kind of shows that. Even with five occasions, there are some cases out there that's, <laughs> but. It's still better than in fisheries what we typically do, which is just catch green and out for gill nets with no. Well, <laughs> yeah, maybe. I don't know. Um, well, there's just uh, there's just a paper published in Biometrics on these in-mixture models. Anybody know what in-mixture models are? That's Andy Royal's big baby here recently, the last couple of five to ten years, where you assume a Poisson distribution and you can take counts and from all that you wave your hands a few times with the Bayesian estimators and you come up with a population estimate. Well, you, everybody thinks you're getting something for nothing. You ought to know better. You don't get something for nothing. And so Barker and Schofield and Lake and, and uh, John's, uh, what you call it, they just published a paper in Biometric that showed you're getting, you're not getting something for nothing, you're getting garbage. And the best that those things are are just good indices at best. The counts are indices. We're right back to new, minimum number known alive, you know, the old small mammal trick. They don't, they don't want to admit that they can't estimate detection probability, so they use this M and T plus 1 effectively as your index. And, you know, the, we call those people the, the uh, P deprived <laughs> or, or the not deprived, what's the right word, I forget, anyway. The point is, is that, you know, they're just, they don't realize how dangerous it is to assume that you've got the constant detection probabilities across these surveys, because you just don't, usually. And, I mean, you, anyway, so, uh, yeah. Let's put it this way. I think we can do better than using the raw counts. 
But we don't want to get too carried away thinking we're getting too close to truth either. And some of the models we're going to talk about later in the week, the Pradell Link Barker kind of models where we estimate lambda and the rate of population change, I think those just are, are a far better route to be thinking about, assuming we can meet some of the assumptions of those models. Uh, and well, I say, anyway, there's still lots of people thinking about this stuff. And I'm sure that we, have, we well, you haven't read the last on it, I guarantee you. Um, we got a bunch of good examples. <clears throat> Any more questions on the slides before I jump out of them? <laughs> I mean, I would never jump out of them. I can't get my cursor to work here. Come on. Workshop examples. Uh, okay. There's a taxi cabs and cottontail data. They're all out there in an exercise on the write up. There is the uh, house mouse. Mouse trapping data is really complicated. I would steer you away from that for the moment. And somewhere, there's a bunch of mono wildlife monograph from the Otis et al. monograph. Yeah, this this is on some page of the book, but uh, I guess where it must be on the CD. Let's go back and look under examples. Closed capture examples. Here's a whole bunch of examples from the Otis et al. monograph, which you actually have a copy of on your zip drive too. Uh, but the snowshoe hair data. And then there's uh, Peregnathus, another small mammal trapping, Paramiscus from Parachute Creek, uh, and then a couple papers out there. Well, there's that White and Cooch paper right there. There's Pledger's paper originally. So anyway, there's a bunch of different data sets out there to work with. And you know, you might want to start off with the Crothers a little, Crothers 10 taxi cab. Ten occasion taxi cab data, just because you've got examples of how to set up the matrices, the design matrices, and so forth, right now. But then branch into some of these others and run some of them. <coughs> Particularly some of the the wildlife monograph ones that are here. They they are nice clean data sets. So work on those. It's we'll see how you're doing. Whether we want to talk a little more later in the day or whether we want to call it quits. And, and uh, in the morning, what we'll do is we'll take up robust design and multi state. The reason why we'll do those then is because we want to be able to do robust design. We want to have this closed capture stuff under our belt. Because the robust design models, including robust design multi state models, all depend on the stuff we just talked about today. Okay. Just to give you a heads up on where we're headed, you think about the Cormac Jolly Seaver model and you got that P. Well, if you go out and you trap for a short period of time and you got a closed capture period there, the P in the Cormac Jolly Seaver model becomes a P star, the probability that you were caught one or more times in the closed captures. And that's how you tie those two together. Yeah? Uh, back earlier with your TBH models, you would do it for the taxi cab models. Can you what now? The, the taxi models went like through TDH models that you ran with taxi cabs. Yeah. And all of the models that you had, the, the H, the heterogeneity, yeah. were all jacked up. Yeah. And you commented that that typically happens sometimes. It does happen, yeah. Is, is, it, uh, is that typical to happen? Or if so, what are the, what's the benefits to having that in there if typically it, oh. it makes it worse? Well, part of the reason they're in there is because it's the only thing we had for quite a while. Right. Shirley published her work back in 2000, and, and this uh, random text model really didn't start making progress until the last 10 years. So that random text model replaces kind of the I think it kind of replaces the H2, yeah. I think it does better. But, but then again, I'm not willing to just say we shouldn't keep using the pleasure model. Because, uh, uh, but, I put the random effects model in lots of different places in Mark now, including in the Cormac Valley Seaver. 
the budget models are also in the Cormac Galaxy because Shirley published a published a paper version of that. But and you guys haven't seen that yet. We only run the simple ones, but you can go and run random effects. Cormac Jolly Sieber models where you have a random effect on P. You can also run the Pledger models where you have a mixture on P. Uh, and well, there's a bunch of other places I won't get into it. But the point being is that I like the random effects models better because biologically they make a more reasonable model to me. You attack it on a random error, I mean, that just. That just I guess I'm ingrained in that way. Okay. Number two, they seem to perform better. They don't blow up like the pleasure ones are occasionally. Now, the, there's, the other, there's another set of Crothers data. There's a Crothers A and a Crothers B. And as I remember, the Huggins models for Huggins B, or Crothers B, work fine. One of them, it works, and one, it doesn't. But, um, I, and I can never tell you why. I mean, I know what happens is we just get one p-value, one of the one of the mixtures, even though it might have a really small probability, it gets a really small value that just blows the thing through the roof, and that just happens periodically. And sorry, one last thing. Sure. You had deleted those. I had to model. I had to because otherwise your model averaging just doesn't make sense. Right. Okay. Another. Yeah. Did you ever delete, say, a model that hardly? Yeah. Assuming that we see. No, because it's no need to. It has no impact. It has, I mean, if it has hardly any weight, it's not going to have any impact. Yeah, the error. Well, you can see what they did to the result. It just blew it up. Yeah. But no, I mean, I, I'm I'm not inclined to go around deleting models. Period. Uh, I mean, again, my goal is to remain just totally objective. And let the data do the talking. Well, sometimes oh, yeah. <laughs> that's just all there is to it. And so that's a case, and I throw it out there because you'll probably encounter that if you run very many closed capture models with the budget. And then you get some of that stuff. And and the fact is the credit's data is not very good data set. But it's kind of neat. You, I like it because you guys can visualize what's going on. I mean, people stand on the corner recording a taxi cab going by, and you can sort of imagine, well, yeah, taxi cabs, and, you know. So, all right. So, I've got a set of models up there, and I want to switch from the PC model to the random effects day. Oh. Uh-oh, 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 uh-oh. Just a second, then I will fix that. Yeah. Okay, so you're running, you're, you got in originally and you, you ran the PNC model Huggins. When you want to jump to the other models, click PIMP, change data type. There's that list again. So if I want to now run the Huggins PNC with random effects model, I highlight that, I go look at my PIM chart, and there's my sigma P and my P's and my C's. So you haven't seen that changing data type. Now, as long as you change to a data type that's compatible with the likelihood, you can use AIC to rank the models. But if you were to change to, say, uh, full likelihood, the full likelihood models are not compatible with AIC and the likelihood. They're different likelihood. So you got to be a little careful. I mean, I, I let you get in trouble if you're not, not aware of what you're doing there. But all the Huggins models are compatible. They, you can rank those with AIC. And so that's how you uh, <laughs> that's how you uh, change data types. Yep, you can add them into your browser. Yeah. And it would change the data type that you've already brought. No, 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 no. They stay. 
They're there, yeah. and you can retrieve those any time, and you'll immediately revert back to that data type. Okay. Your PIMS will go back. Okay. Yeah, when you retrieve the model, everything comes back. Uh, one of the design criteria in Mark that I started off with was you've got to have a history of how you got to where you got. And so every model, when you run it, you retrieve it, it's all right back there on your screen. You can get right back to it. you got to be able to see what you did so that you know what you screwed up. <laughs> That's a quote for the book. <laughs> <laughs> All right.